uh, Pastor Scott Lively. He has a uh, ministry in the city of Springfield, Massachusetts. And folks, he is probably one of the most courageous Christian men I happen to know. I know a lot of them, and a lot of them are here. Uh, and uh, Pastor Lively has an inner city ministry coffee shop in, uh, right in Springfield. And I met him about five years ago at a July 4th uh, Patriot rally. But uh, in, in the mid-90s, I read his book, The Pink Swastika. Uh, and uh, I ha interviewed him uh, long before I knew him I, per in, in person on a radio show in Nashua when I was on a radio show. And I was very delighted that I learned that he was from the Boston area originally. And uh, so without further ado, I want to bring up, let's give a nice warm hand. God bless you all. Thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. And uh, I'm Pastor Scott Lively. Uh, I, uh, I run the Inner City Mission Holy Grounds Coffee House in Springfield, Massachusetts, right across from uh, Springfield Technical Community College. Uh, years ago, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I, I started uh, drinking when I was 12 years old. Uh, I started taking drugs when I was 14. I spent 16 years in bondage uh, to alcohol and drugs. I hitchhiked all over the United States. I slept under bridges. I ate in missions. I begged for money on the street corners. I was as down and out as anybody that you see out there uh, in the cities these days. Uh, but in 1986, on February 1st, I got down on my knees. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And I was completely, instantly, totally healed by a miracle of God at that very, very moment. Amen. Praise God. And then God took me from that place where I was really of no good use to anybody. And, uh, and over time, he has given me a very powerful ministry. And he's equipped me in many ways. I, I'm today a, a licensed attorney in, in California. Although a lot of people would say that's not really a step up. But, uh, that always gets a good laugh. Uh, but uh, I, I was able to graduate magna cum laude from Trinity Law School, a Christian law school. Uh, I have a Doctor of Theology degree from the Pentecostal Assemblies of God. I hold a certificate in international human rights from Strasbourg uh, in France. And I've written five books. I've been on more than 700 radio and television shows all over the world. And I want to talk to you this morning about, uh, about the homosexual issue. And I'm going to touch on the pink swastika. Uh, these are my two books here. Uh, this is a history book dealing with uh, the, the first major modern homosexual movement uh, which started in Germany. It didn't start here in the United States. And the other book is, uh, is titled Redeeming the Rainbow. This is a textbook for understanding the homosexual issue. And you guys are, are actually the, the best group to actually read something like this because that's what it's written for. I, I thought this was going to be my last book on the topic. I put everything I, I learned in 20 years into this as concisely and as simply as possible uh, so that people would be able to, to understand, deal with this issue. So both of these are resources that are going to be beneficial for you because you, your generation is going to be dealing with this issue uh, like nothing ever before. This is, uh, this is the moral issue of our times. It is the foundation of the entire culture war. And I'm going to be t describing things to you that almost nobody knows in this country. It's very obscure. Even most of the pastors, even, even people that are in the culture war fighting for biblical values, most of them don't realize that the culture war at its foundation is more than anything else a conflict between Christians and homosexuals. That's right. And, and it's, it, this, almost nobody knows that. It's very obscure. It's very, uh, it's very hidden. But... I just want to give you the basic fundamental principles of it and take this. And if you've got no paper, I'm also going to walk you through the scriptures. You need to be equipped how to deal with this issue. Your generation has been completely brainwashed on this topic. And frankly, there are probably even people in this room, even kids that are here, in order to learn the fundamentals of, of, of the perspective of the founding fathers, the biblical worldview and how it applies to, to our form of government. Even among this group, you are going to, you are probably, because of the, of, the, of the intensity of the propaganda campaign that has been waged against you, uh, are, are, uh, are likely to have been influenced to some degree by this. And, and uh, so I want to just get right down to it and, and explain what's going on here. That, that the culture war 
uh, and, and this battle that we're, we're facing between, between those who believe in limited government and those who believe in statism and all the different ways you can divide people into the two groups, it really comes down all the way at the bottom to a difference of opinion and a difference of philosophy and worldview about sexuality that at, the, at the, very, the very first thing that we learn out of the Bible in terms of human government and, and family and, and human society is that we're created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. We're created male and female in his image, two complementary halves of one whole. And in Genesis 2.24, it, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his family and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's standard for sexuality and for family. It's the foundation of all civilization. Without it, civilization cannot exist. Marriage is the, is the institution created by God to be a cocoon in which the natural family of a man and a woman are able to be protected from the forces of nature that would otherwise destroy it. The primary one being the idea of sexual freedom or sexual promiscuity. Because even though a man and a woman will, will, will easily come together to form a, a, a family bond and a family unit, if there wasn't the institution of marriage, that would be eroded by temptation, by disagreements between the two of them, and, and frankly, that's why our society is in such a mess right now, because we have lost the understanding of that. Well, the perspective that I've just been describing is God's perspective called the Judeo-Christian sexual ethic. The idea that, 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 uh, that sexuality belongs inside of marriage only, that, that, that uh, everything outside of it is illicit and corrupt and dangerous, and that we are designed to enter into a lifelong monogamous heterosexual union with somebody of the opposite sex. And that society has an obligation to discourage all forms of conduct that are contrary to that. Not necessarily to stamp them out. I mean, there's always been people who engage in all kinds of different forms of sexual deviance and promiscuity. So that's just human nature. Uh, but as long as those groups are simply subcultures and not the mainstream, we can survive it. Just like in, in our bodies. Every single one of us is walking around with diseases in our body that would kill us just like that if our immune systems weren't working. And human society has an immune system also that's based on the natural family structure, the, the system and network of natural families united by marriage so that, just, so that just the fact that some people are outside of that, you know, in subcultures, doesn't mean society collapses. But once it becomes mainstream, then everything changes. It's sort of like if you decided today that you weren't going to eat anything but candy from now on, right? You'd last for a few weeks. And at the end of that time, you, everything would start to break down in your body, right? Your, 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 your skin would be, would be oozing with, with, uh, with, with sores, you know, your, your, your organs would be breaking down. And it's just that because your immune system wouldn't be able to handle, wouldn't be able to hold back and resist the, uh, the corrupting influences. And so this idea of marriage and the idea of sexuality belonging only inside of marriage is, is essential to healthy civilization. Now... In the late 1940s, there was a, the, 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 the modern homosexual movement in America was launched. It didn't start here in the United States. It started in Germany in the 1860s. This is 400 pages of documentation about what happened in Germany. And that very few people know this. This is very heavily suppressed. Uh, and frankly, the homosexual movement has such power in this country that the facts that are in this book have not been allowed to be published in textbooks, or, or you know, trade publications uh, since the, the, the late 1960s and early 70s. You have to actually go to books published before that to find the information. But there's a massive amount of it when you do that. But in any case, that, uh, I'll get to, to that a little bit and, and deal with that, with that topic. But what's more important is you understand that here in this country, after the uh, World War II, the center of homosexual power in the country shifted to the United States. And there was a, there was a, uh, the, the leader was named Harry Hay. Harry Hay was a teacher of Marxism for 18 years before he founded the organization called the Mattachine Society. Harry, you know, Marxism, and this, and communism is something you guys 
kind of an understanding of just because of your leaders. And the John Birch Society has been the leader in, in educating people about communism for a long time. But the, the essence of, of Marxism, which is the foundation of communism, but the essence of it is the idea built on evolution, the idea that human society is evolving naturally toward a perfect, harmonious society, in which everybody gets to do anything that they want, and nobody has, ever has any conflict with any other person, etc. It's a utopian fantasy that the Marxists have. And, but they also understood that if you just sit, let it happen naturally, it's going to take forever to get there. And so the Marxist strategy was to tear down the existing system so they could rebuild the world in the image of their fantasy on the ashes of the old world. That's why Marxism is so incredibly dangerous and because they want to destroy everything. Now they say they're doing it, you know, it's the end justifies the means. That's the problem with all of the left. The end justifies the means. The end of achieving this perfect harmonious society justifies the destruction of everything that's going on right now. Right? Now, the Marxism uh, was focused primarily on economics. And the, the Marxists would organize in cell groups and, and, uh, and they, would, they would train their people to go after and deal with the economic systems. And that's why they attack capitalism, right? They're into, they're into communism and socialism, they're attacking capitalism. But in the uh, uh, about 100 and some years ago, uh, there was a, a school of communism in, uh, in Germany called the Frankfurt School. And the Frankfurt School actually shifted its focus away from economics to culture. And they realized they could much more quickly accomplish the dismantling and destruction of civilization if they focused on, on, uh, on, on overturning and overthrowing the culture. And the civilization would collapse much faster than if they just dealt with economics. And so that's, that's what these guys began to do. There's a, there's a man named Herbert Marcuse, uh, who was the primary uh, uh, teacher of this. He emigrated here to the U.S. He was a very high-level college professor at Brandeis, at Columbia, at, uh, at, at UC Berkeley, and then all the rest of the people he was working with in Germany, they ended up over here too, in the, in the high-level, very high-level colleges, teaching this idea. Marcuse's idea, and, and the belief of this school, was that sexuality was the way to tear it down. And that even though Marcuse was a heterosexual, he realizes that, realized that the, that the most important agents of destroying moral culture were homosexuals. Because that is, that their, their idea of sexual freedom is, is, is central to, to their whole agenda. And, uh, and so, anyway, that's where this uh, philosophy, this idea is, comes from. Harry Hay organized all the homosexual activists into secret cell groups. Remember, this is in the late 1940s. Homosexuality was illegal in this country. It was illegal in the entire world, except for the country of Sweden, which legalized sodomy in 1938. And so, if, if Harry Hay had come out and he said that, uh, I'm going to go down to the grammar school, and I'm going to, to, to tell all the kids, all the, all the five and six year olds down there, that, that being gay is a good thing and they ought to try it, he would have been thrown in jail if he hadn't been killed on the way down there. Right? This is how serious everybody took this kind of thing. But, you know what? That's exactly what's happening right now in California. For two years, the state of California has had mandatory instruction. Gay propaganda has been mandatory as part of the curriculum for two years. Right? How did they get there in just, in just 50 years, 50, 60 years? It's they did it by systematic uh, overthrow of, of, of culture. And they couldn't come out and begin uh, promoting homosexuality is a good thing. They had to begin promoting heterosexual promiscuity, right? And they're really the ones who launched the so-called sexual revolution. It wasn't a natural, spontaneous uh, change of American society. It was the actual dismantling of the, of the biblical worldview, the idea that sex belongs in marriage only, right? And that sex outside of marriage should be discouraged. That's the biblical worldview. They were working to replace that with a different worldview based on sexual freedom, in which the idea is that everybody gets to do whatever they want to sexually uh, without restrictions except for the principle of mutual consent. Right? That's it's enormously destructive to society. But that's, what the, that's the culture we have today. That is the worldview 
of the Hollywood movies. That's the world view of the television programming that's happening today. That's the world view of the people that set up Facebook and that set up Google and that set up uh, all these other institutions. It's the world view of the college professors and the governors of, of a substantial numbers of states and, uh, and other leading uh, culture shaping uh, individuals sitting in the seats of power. That's what the culture war is all about. It's a conflict between these two worldviews. And they are not complementary. They cannot coexist. They are absolutely contradictory and exclusive. You, if you cannot at the same time have a society that says sex belongs inside of marriage and at the same time have a value system that says sex does not belong in marriage. That these think they're, they're contradictory. And only one of them is able to prevail. And the future of our society depends on who wins that debate, who wins that argument. And frankly, the other side has been winning this for a very long time. You guys have never known a time where that wasn't the worldview of your culture. I still remember when I was a child, the biblical worldview was still the model in, uh, in and I grew up in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, fairly small town. Uh, Massachusetts was fairly conservative at that point. And I remember, I was part of the generation that changed it because I was taught the, that new idea and I began to live that new idea and, and, and I helped to tear things down. Now I realize the enormous mistake that I was involved in, but you guys have never known a time when, when, when people would have been, uh, would have been uh, scornful of television shows in which nobody's married, right? Everybody's hopping into bed with each other. That, that was when I was, I mean, it was leave it to beaver, and, and uh, you know, and, and people laugh about those things now, but the value system was Christian, and the value system we're dealing with now isn't. Now, the culture war is what, is, is what uh, you guys really, at, at essence, no matter what issue you're dealing with, even if you're dealing with economic issues, it still comes down to the same problem. And let me just explain how this works, because that that the, the, when, when this uh, movement, this gay movement, became, became uh, coming forward with this new philosophy of sexual freedom, they were, the goal was to corrupt heterosexual morality so that they could get everybody else morally corrupt so that they would be more willing, when it was time for the gays to come out of the closet that, and take their place at the head of the sexual freedom parade, that, that everyone else would be less willing to disagree with them. Right? Oh, well, I can't say anything because I use pornography, or I can't say anything because I've been married five times, or I can't say anything because I've had an abortion, or whatever. And the idea was, if you wait long enough, if you promote that idea long enough, and that you get enough people who are actually, whose personal values have been changed as a result of the, this philosophy, then when the time comes uh, for, uh, to step out and say, now we want open homosexuality to be accepted, then they, then they were going to accomplish the objective. And that happened in the late 1960s, and since then it's been, been, been continuing on. Now, the, the consequences of sexual promiscuity are predictable. Now, if, if you had gone back and, you were, and, and were looking at the society of the 1940s and the 1950s, and all of a sudden somebody's coming along and saying, we're not going to worry about people having to be married anymore about, uh, in order to have a sexual relationship. We're not going to be, be, be worried any, anymore about whether they're in, in, engaging in adultery or fornication or homosexuality or other types of sexual perversion. We're just going to mainstream all those things. You would have said, okay, what's going to happen? Families are going to break apart, are going to break down. And that's exactly what happened. Beginning in the late 1960s or the mid-1960s, the free love movement and all that, right? you have now have huge numbers of people that no longer care about marriage that are now engaging in sexual relations with other people who have the same value system and all kinds of babies are being born, right? Because that's what happens when men and women get together, right? So they had to come up with some kind of a system to stop that. So in 1966, in the case of Grizzled versus Connecticut, they came out with contraception on demand. Contraception was not always allowed. You couldn't go down to the store and buy, unless you were married. If you were married, you could, you could use, get contraception at the store, but everybody knew that the only reason for contraception, for condoms and all these other things, is to facilitate, to make it easier for people to engage in fornication. That's the only reason that that exists. 
And for people to be able to, to indulge themselves in sex outside of marriage, thinking that there's not going to be consequences for it. 1966, that came in, contraception on demand for the whole country. Right? So now, there are fewer babies being conceived, but there's still a lot of them, because contraception doesn't always work and people don't always use it. So, uh, once again, there's lots of babies being born, and here's, this is a big problem for the people pushing sexual freedom. Because the more babies that are born, the more you realize that this is not a workable system. Right? Somebody has to take care of these babies. And, and what's happening to, the, to all these people that are now, uh, that are now creating babies and not sticking together? Right? So, so they had to have a backup system to contraception, which is abortion. Abortion is the backup system to contraception so that people could continue to, 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 uh, to embrace uh, sexual freedom as, their, as the central value instead of the biblical model of marriage, right? That, you know, get, getting where, how serious this is, right? That, so by 1973, when Roe versus Wade came along, all the different aspects of the culture were already in place, and they're all rooted in the problem of people rejecting God's standard for sex and embracing the demonic of sex that there shouldn't be any restrictions. And then all hell breaks loose in our society. See, just because women can kill their children doesn't mean they're all going to do it. In fact, God had put, has put the maternal instinct in women to, to, to love their children. So just because they can kill them just doesn't mean they're all going to do it. So there's still a lot of babies being born, right? Not as many as there would be. Not enough to rock the boat to, to force us back to the old ways, but enough to really start causing problems. And so beginning in the 1970s, you have huge numbers of women who now have children and no husband, right? The man has gone off to find somebody else to sleep with, and the woman, just because she wasn't willing to kill her child, now is stuck with the responsibility of taking care of the one or more children that she has by these now absent men. Now, she can't work, she can't hold a job, she's got to take care of her child, right? So what has to happen? Somebody has to step in and provide the, the, the resources for her to be able to live, to have a place to live and food to eat and, and medical care for herself and her children. And that was when all the entitlement programs were just swept into the country. We all know what entitlement programs are. It's basically government funding of whatever it is that they think is important, right? And along with the entitlement programs, as soon as they're established, the more people you have involved in them, the more money it takes, right? And where are they going to get the money? The money has to come from the taxpayers. There's no other place to get the money. And so the taxes go up and up and up and up to fund the entitlement programs to pay for the services for the children and women who don't have a husband. And the men are off getting somebody else pregnant, right? And, and so therefore, you see that that all of these things, even when you're talking about fiscal issues, you're still talking about the breakdown of godly sexuality yeah. and the replacement with this demonic alternative that tears men and women apart and turns them really into, into animals in which they no longer are concerned about living a life of morality and, and you know, God's idea is, is perfect, right? Everything that God has told us to do, if we actually did it, just think about it for a second. If we actually did what God told us to do regarding anything, but especially dealing with sexuality, right? That we waited until we're married to have sex, that sex belongs only in there. We don't, we don't cheat on our spouse. We stay faithful and loyal to them. We devote ourselves to raising our children in the way that they should go, right? If we did just those simple, basic things, there would be no sexually transmitted diseases. Right. There would be no divorces. There would be there would be uh, uh, hardly any of, this, of the social, uh, negative social indicators that we have today at, at epidemic levels. What do we have instead? Right? When I was a teenager, there were only a, a handful of sexually transmitted diseases. Right. Now there are way over a hundred of them, and most of them are at, 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 at epidemic levels. I mean, when you're talking epidemic, we're talking like HPV, for example, is over 75% of women of, of childbearing years in the United States have HPV, which should sterilize you and all that. This is one. And there are lots and lots and lots of others. All this is a consequence of simply turning away from what God said to do and listening to a worldly alternative 
that the devil is designed to destroy you. Right? right. Now, when it comes to the homosexual issue, right, I started, when I first got saved, I came out of, of, a, of a life in which I believed all of those things. I lived those ways. I slept with a lot of women. I partied all the time. I took all kinds of drugs. I lived the life that they said to live. It almost killed me. When I got saved and the Lord changed me, I came out of that and started having an understanding of the truth of things. I started reading the Bible and He started renewing my mind so I could understand the, the, the way He had made things to be. And I, and I saw God's goodness compared to the devil's lies yeah. and how, how essential it is for us to be able to actually just embrace what God said to do. If we do that, that if you follow what God says to do, you get good results always. If you don't follow what God says to do, you get bad results always. And I began to, to learn that and understand it. Well, the first thing that happened to me, well, first I, a couple of years the Lord took to kind of teach me how to be a man, right? I didn't know how to function. And after a couple of years, he, he led me into ministry, and my ministry at first was dealing with abortion. You know what happened? I saw a picture of an aborted baby. How many people here have seen a picture of an aborted baby, right? If you haven't seen a picture of an aborted baby, just it's terribly, terribly gross. But, but you, got, you have to do that just to understand the nature of, of the demonic spirit behind this agenda. Right? The, 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 the goal of the devil is to rob, kill, and destroy. He's like a ravenous lion seeking whom he may devour. He's the father of lies and the ultimate deceiver who is able to spin lies that are so subtle and so devious that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived by him. Even those who have been chosen by God to spend eternity with him would be deceived if it were possible. That's how strong his delusions are. And we have to be guarded against that. And the only way to do that is to have a, is a, have a biblical worldview, to be grounded in the truth of the Bible, to be committed to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and to always to love more than anything else, to love the truth. Because whatever you love more than truth, is the door that the devil's going to come through to take over your, your mind and your life and steer you off into, into hell. But take a picture, take a, take a look at, at an unborn baby who has been torn apart by abortion. When, that, when I saw that, the first time I saw that, it ripped my heart. How could this be happening in America? How could they be doing this? It was a, it was a, little, a little baby that, that had been taken apart inside the mother's womb and had been laid out on a table next to, the, next to where she was lying, on a towel. And they had to, they had to get, make sure they got all the pieces, because if they left any inside, that she would, she would die from the infection of a rotting piece of human flesh inside of her body. So they had the little head, they had the arms, they had the, they had the hands with the little tiny fingernails, and the legs and the toenails, and, and the perfect, a perfect little human being. And I, my whole life was changed when I saw that. I said, I am, going to, I am going to work to stop this from happening. And I began, I did that. I, within a few months, I had completely shut down my business. I was going full time and trying to stop the killing of the unborn. I was going down to the abortion clinic all by myself. I didn't join any group. I didn't ask anybody for what to do. I just went and did it. And I'm standing there with signs in front of the clinic and meeting all the other pro-lifers and, and over time building up a following. I used to go on the Christian radio every afternoon, Lou Davies in Portland, Oregon. And, and, and I became actually a regular feature of the show because every day I would call in to say where I was going to be that day and what was going on, what's the pro-life news. And then after about a year or so of that, uh, the, the, the biggest event I'd ever set up, 800 people came out to an Easter Eve prayer vigil at the Lovejoy Abortion Clinic. And... and and in the midst of all that, I realized, you know, this is not going to solve the problem. Just simply, just simply testifying to, the, to, the, to this, it's not really changing anything. Yes, it's witnessing, and some women are turning away from killing their, their babies from this, but there has to be something more, and so I got, started getting involved in politics and, and in all that. But really what the Lord did in this process, he, he showed me, as evil as abortion is, it's not as destructive as the homosexual agenda. Why? Because abortion is a symptom of the problem of sexual freedom. It's a consequence of sexual freedom. But the homosexual movement the, the, is, the, is an army 
of social engineers. They are the ones who ca are carrying the philosophy of sexual freedom and are teaching it and, and working every single day to take away the Christian foundation of the country and to replace it with this new gay ethic of sexual freedom, which is really sexual anarchy. It's moral <laughs> anarchy. Right. And when the Lord opened my eyes to that, then I realized that that had to be my life's work. And ever since then, that's what I've been focused on. Now, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to be a person standing up and saying that homosexuality is wrong in today's society. And there, everyone who does that, and if you do that yourselves, which you should do in a, in a, in a careful way, is, is going to be abused. You are going to be persecuted Absolutely. for standing on this truth. And this is the hard thing to say. Right, especially for people that they don't even know that it's all that much, to, all that bad a thing to deal with anyway. Ah, it's just well, who cares what people are doing in the privacy of their, of their bedroom, etc. Well, I don't care, except I, I would rather somebody not doing something that's destructive to them. But if the homosexual movement was still in the closet and and they were just living as a subculture and they had their gay bars and all that stuff and they were doing that, I would be unhappy for the consequences to them, but I wouldn't be involved in public policy about it. But what happened is they came out and they began demanding to change the entire world and their image. Right? At the beginning, when Harry Hay first started, the, the ostensible, the, the goal that they put forward at that time was they said, we want the right to be left alone. Right? Which means tolerance. Tolerance means putting up with something you don't like in order to maintain civility. Right? That's what, that's what tolerance really means. Now, they had a deeper agenda, but that's what they said that, what, that they wanted. But in, on uh, June 28, uh, 1969, the homosexual movement shifted from that goal uh, during the Stonewall riot yeah. 1969. Right. They changed their focus, and they went from, from, from looking for tolerance to looking for complete and total control of our society, in which all the seats of power are in their hands or in the hands of someone who is completely in agreement with their agenda. Now that sounds pretty, pretty strong to say, right? But that is exactly what's been going on. And, and most people have no idea of this perspective because you never get information that opposes them. It's been completely suppressed. You don't see it on any television programs. The only time you see coverage or, or arguments against homosexuality is when they find somebody like Fred Phelps or something like that that they can mock or that they can point out and say, oh, this is a raving bigot, right? You never hear. The stuff I'm tell talking to you today, you never hear that out in the world. It's completely suppressed. I have been persecuted more than anybody that I know. I'm being sued right now in federal court in Springfield, Massachusetts for crimes against humanity, for preaching against homosexuality in Uganda, right? This is a category of crimes it was created to persecute the Nazis, to prosecute the Nazis after, after World War II. And these people have managed, they, they've made such a change in the world. Think about it, you guys. You, you, don't, you've never li you haven't lived long enough to, to understand how significant this is. But in the space of just 50 years, this movement, this tiny, tiny per uh, group of people that represents only 2% of the population, has managed to gain more power in the legislatures and the courtrooms of the world than the Christian church has. That's right. That's right. More power than the Christian church has. And this is a group of people who is, whose value system is utterly destructive to society. And yet here, they're the ones sitting in the seats of power now. And the people like me have marginalized to the, to the point where they can get away with filing a lawsuit against me for crimes against humanity just for preaching the gospel. Things are coming down in a way that you, you're going to see over the next few years a transformation of our society like, you, like has never happened before. It has been moving more rapidly and more rapidly since the 1960s, and, but it was started up very slow back then. The inertia, you know, the, the, it was like an ocean liner. If you, if you want to change the direction of an ocean liner, right, it takes a long time to get that ship turned around because the inertia is pushing it in a, in a direction. Right? But eventually, when you get it around and turned around, then the engines can, can pick up and it can go full speed ahead in the other direction. Well, we just reached that point. When the homosexual movement adopted that goal of absolute control in, in 1969, 
they set out an agenda to take down every institution that stood in their way. The first one was the American Psychiatric Association in 1973. That they did that because the APA said homosexuality is a mental disorder. It is a mental disorder. It never stopped being a mental disorder, but they were able to force the board of the APA to take it out of the, of the, of the book by political pressure, by brown shirt tactics, the very same stuff that the Nazis did. The, 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 the Nazi party was an outgrowth of the German gay subculture, a masculine-oriented male homosexuals who persecuted effeminate male homosexuals who are associated with the Communist Party. And they, but, but the modern homosexual movement uses the same kinds of tactics. And they were breaking into the meetings of the APA. Let's just to say that this is, this is a group of, you're a group of, of psychiatrists and psychologists who are meeting to talk about the latest advances in helping people overcome homosexuality. Because at that point, there was a lot of work being done on that. And, and it was very, very promising. A lot of people were coming out, right? But these gay activists would break in, they smash through the windows, right? They come in, they kick the tables over, they shout down, say, you're, you're criminals, you're war criminals, right? And they, these doctors, they're not, they're not political activists, they're not culture warriors, they're like, whoa, what's going on here? And after about a, a, a year or so of that, they gave in. They said, we can't take this anymore, okay, leave us alone, we're going to take it out. And they did. The gays moved in, they have had control of the APA ever since. Then they moved on to the next institution, then the next institution, then the next institution for 40 years, right? The very last institution, secular institution, with an official policy against homosexuality, just fell about three weeks ago. Anybody remember what that was? Exodus. No, the Boy Scouts of America. See, that Exodus was not, and is another problem, but that's a secular, I mean, that's a Christian organization. I'm talking about secular institutions. The Boy Scouts of America is the last secular institution in America to have an official policy against homosexuality. And they gave in to the same tactics. See, in, in the year 2000, the Boy Scouts of America got a Supreme Court decision recognizing their constitutional right to discriminate against homosexuals in their organization. Right? When I use the word discriminate in that way, that's not a bad thing. We're supposed to discriminate against things that are bad. We're supposed to, 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 to favor things that are good. And the Supreme Court recognized the Boy Scouts' right to do that. Now, how many people get a Supreme Court ruling defending their right to certain policy? And yet, even with that, it wasn't enough to stop them from caving into the gays. Because the gays, they never stop. It's like right. the Terminator. It's the Terminator. Sure. That it's relentless, implacable pursuit of the goal of completely remaking the world in their image, to turn the whole world gay. Now, they know not every person is going, to be, is going to become a homosexual, but they want the entire world to be dominated by this, this sexual freedom ethic, and they want to be in charge of it, and they're going to punish everybody who disagrees with them. Oh, yeah. the, 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 the organization just before the Boy Scouts that fell was the American military, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. In the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, our military fell to the gays. There's nobody left in the secular world. The Republican Party, kind of, but they're not going to last very long. They don't, the Republican establishment has never been interested in this issue. That's a, that's a foregone conclusion. That, that's out the door. There's nobody left except the church. Right? And so what you're gonna, what, what's happened over this past 40 years is we have seen an army. Right? Think, think about this in terms of the military, right? The, our military, beginning in about in, in, at 9-11. We have vast numbers of soldiers and a gigantic war machine that has been used, whether you, whether you approve the policy or not, that has been used to advance the elite's interest in America around the world. And so there's a gigantic army, huge amounts of armaments that have been engaged in this battle, right? They're tried, they're tested, they're veteran, right? That's what the gay movement is in this country. They have been, for 40 years, they have been building an army, they have been building tactics and and armaments of different different kinds, rhetorical arguments, all kinds of things. And now, the last secular enemy has fallen. There's still mop-up to be done, right? They still need to get homosexuals into the leadership of the Boy Scouts. Uh, but, but uh, you know, that, that's mop-up. And so what's next? Sure. What's next is the church. Sure. And so beginning right now, I just put out an article just a couple of weeks ago, just before the Supreme Court ruling, that terrible Supreme Court ruling, striking down DOMA, 
and for all intents and purposes striking down Prop 8 on a technicality. We lost both of the marriage issues at the same time, right? meaning that this process is going to move even faster than it was going to move before. And Exodus International, DOMA, the, the, the Defense of Marriage Act, right? The federal government, in a, in a large, large majority, the Congress voted to define marriage as between a man and a woman. It was signed by, by President Clinton, right? This was the law of the land regarding all federal properties and, and federal law, and the Supreme Court struck it down just, a, uh, just two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. This is bad, bad stuff. So get the picture. This entire army of all of these veteran soldiers whose goal is to remake the world in their own image with vast resources and all this equipment and, and tactics are now going to focus at the church. And what you're going to see, you're going to see attacks from outside, from the secular world. Every corner of the secular world is going to start attacking the church. But even worse, from inside the church is going to become what's called gay theology. Right? And this is the most important. How much more time do I have left? Seven minutes. Okay. Get out your notebooks. I'm going to give you a set of scriptures. You need to be equipped to be able to respond to people. Gay theology is, a, is, the, is the heresy of the end times. It's, it's, the, it is a, it's the, the twisting the Bible in order to present homosexuality as something approved by God. Right? They say that, that Jonathan and David were gay, that, uh, that, that Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't destroyed because of homosexuality, because of inhospitality. There's a whole very extensive theology that has been built by these guys, starting with, with a professor at Yale named Boswell uh, in the 80s or something. And they've been building on it ever since. Most Christians are completely unaware that it even exists. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to start coming into the church like a flood. And if you're not ready for it, see, this what's happening with this issue that this is, an, this is, I believe, the, this is the issue in which Christians are being tested yes. as to whether they're going to stand for the Bible right. or whether they're going, they're going to capitulate to the world. Exactly. Because there's no advantage, right? There's no advantage except Jesus Christ's appreciation for standing up against homosexuality. Right. Nobody's going to understand. You're going to get called a hater, yeah. right? That, that you're going to get persecuted for doing it. That, that the people who are on our side, most, most Christians are not going to understand what you're doing. They're not going to appreciate it. They just think it's just another sin. Or In the Bible, it's not treated. It's, what's that? What Justice Kennedy... I only got seven there. minutes, please. Uh, um, that that the, this, the, the set of scriptures, this is my great brother, but I only got time I got. Let's go through the Bible. You need to be equipped with this. All right. Number one, Genesis 127 and 224. That's the biblical paradigm of sexuality. Then, Genesis 19 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And immediately after that, tied in, actually the, the ancient rabbis actually teach that the last straw that brought the deluge, that brought Noah's flood, was when they started having homosexual marriage. That's what the ancient rabbis say. And if you think about it, that's what did Jesus say? And what does the story of, of, of Genesis 19 say? There's two, two clues that were given about what was happening then. They were marrying and giving in marriage, and the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. Right? Anyway, I'll leave it with that. There's more, but let's move moving on. Right? Then, after Genesis 19, there's a second witness of the same t story in Judges 19. Right? God often uses two witnesses in the scripture when he wants to make a point about something. Judges 19 tells a story very similar where the homosexuals of the town came to rape the visitor. Right? Just as they did in Sodom and Gomorrah. And here, just stop for just a second and get this essence of the spirit, the demonic spirit behind this movement. Yeah. Right? In Sodom and Gomorrah, in, in the city of Sodom, where the angels came to rescue Lot and to take his family out before God would destroy it with, with fire and brimstone. The only place in scripture where God uses fire and brimstone. It's the example. Remember, he destroyed the earth once by what? Water. By water. The second time is going to be by what? Fire. By fire. That is the example. And it says in both Peter and in Jude that it's set forth as the example of what happens to the ungodly. Right? In Sodom, when the two angels came in the form of men to rescue Lot, it says all the men of the city from every quarter, young and old, came to rape the two men. Right? And even when they were offered Lot's daughters as a substitute, they refused. And they were so determined to do this that they're clawing and pushing each other, clawing at the door. <laughs> until they're struck blind. 
and they're still they still continue right that's the spirit that's why it's it's implacable it cannot be placated right. it's that's why it's like the terminator its goal is absolute control and and full uh, accomplishing of its own objective at any cost the end justifies the means anyway continuing down the path of the scripture Leviticus 18 Leviticus 18 is the list of sins they're all sexual sins but the, they're the list of sins that God tells the Hebrews that these are the things that the Canaanites were doing that caused them to be vomited out of the land, right? God's saying, you're going in to cleanse the land of these people, but actually what's happening is the land itself is vomiting out these people because of what they did. And that is a list of sexual sins right in the middle of, of this. God introduces the word abomination for the first time in this list when it says, you shall not lie with a, a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. And then, it, and then the, the next one says, you shall not lie with an animal. Right? It, is, it is despicable. Right? Those two things, that's actually the definition of sodomy historically. Yeah. It's not anal sex or oral sex. The, def, the classic definition of sodomy is sex between two people of the same gender or sex with an animal. And Thomas Jefferson, who wrote a restatement of the law, said the worst of those two things, between homosexuality and bestiality, the worst was homosexuality because bestiality doesn't spread. Right? This is Thomas Jefferson who wrote that. Then you go down the, down the list. Right? You've got, you've got uh, the story of Josiah. Josiah dealing with cleansing the temple. Right? One of the things he had to do, I forget the, the it's a Josiah 23. I mean, is it, uh, is it uh, Kings or... Uh, I think First Kings or Second Kings. I think Chapter Twenty Three. I don't have that one memorized, but but it's the story of Josiah, who is who is identified as the most righteous of the kings. One of the things he had to do was to, was to destroy the houses of the sodomites, which had been set up at at the temple where the women were weaving hangings for the sacred oak grove. That's where they went and engaged in sexual perversion as part of the Canaanite religion, and they also sacrificed in, in, innocent in, infant children to Molech there by burning them to death, right? This is what they did in those, in those rituals. Josiah stopped that. That's, that's in that chapter. Jump ahead. There's other passages, just to stick with the big ones. There's three of them in the New Testament. That The first one is Romans chapter 1, especially 18 through 32, right? Of all the sins that God could have used to, to, to describe and define the reprobate mind, he used homosexuality. Yeah. Uh, because... Because the, uh, the creation of our bodies is actually part of the creation itself that God says we don't have any excuse for not recognizing who he is. Anyway, you've got to read that. Very, very important. Then the next one is, uh, well, I talked to you about the, the Jude. The passage of Jude is Jude. It's only one chapter long, but it's verse 7, talking about the reason for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But then the last one I want to mention to you is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. It's the ex-gay passage. And it basically says that, do you not know that this, group, this list of people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? And included in that list are homosexuals and transvestites. And it says, it says, but such were some of you, but you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that tells us that there have been ex-gays inside the Christian church from the very beginning and it also shows that, that people can be healed from homosexuality. Right, and that God has always done that. And this idea, see, your whole generation has been, has been trained uh, to, 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 be, to cringe when somebody says that because they'll ridicule the idea. Oh, gays changing. And they put, they put the word cure in, in parentheses, <coughs> mocking the very idea. You always know how, how strong a Christian or conservative argument by how loud the other side yells. So don't let them intimidate you by that stuff. But, but just think this, this one last thing, because this, this is a central idea that it is, it's simply ridiculous to say that a person cannot change back to a sexual orientation that conforms with the design of their body. Right? It's ridiculous to suggest that they can't do that. Right? And, that's, and all of us, every single one of us, has a heterosexual physiology. You're either male or female. There's no third sex, right? So, so to, to conform your sexual perspective and orientation to the way your body is made is just natural. It's not, it's not unnatural, and it's not impossible. And I guess I've run out of time. So uh, anybody that wants to get on my mailing list, I have the forms there. And I'm going to donate 10 copies of each of my books.
uh, to the camp. So, God bless you.